Hello everyone. I'm trying to uh, get the video set up here as everybody is joining in. Give everybody a few minutes to to get on. Starting a few minutes late, I was trying to set up both video and um, also my webcam. anybody here let's see here I'm trying to uh, see if anybody is on yet it's been a while since I've done a Facebook live looks like things are working hopefully I have not seen anybody commenting yet but All right. oh here we go we got a few people trying to figure out how to work Facebook here this is not uh, all right, so there's at least 14 people tuned in so far, and it looks like it's working. So I'm going to get started. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Eric Ely. I'm the founder of Well Life Family Medicine. I'm also an assistant professor over at Texas Tech in, um, here in Amarillo. Um, looks like I see a few names here that I recognize. And um, we've created a, a supplement line called Well Life Bioceuticals, and one of the the products is called Hashi Help. But um, you know, this is for you guys. I um, watching, trying to watch, keep an eye on some of the comments here. So if y'all have questions, feel free to reach out and we will go through some of this stuff. Um, so talking about over the next hour or so on this cold morning, we're going to talk about some of the just basics of thyroid, some of the different thyroid diseases, some of the lab tests to look at. Um, we'll talk about 10 reasons why uh, we still have hypothyroid sy symptoms. Uh, and uh, the five R's of healing Hashimoto's, general suggestions, and then our supplement Hashi Help. There it goes. So there's a little bit of delay here, so I'm trying to uh, get this all figured out. So just to start off with kind of a dev devil's advocate kind of question here, you know, I, we see a ton of patients in our clinic, and, and they're always wondering, is it their thyroid? And so there's up to 20 million Americans that have some form of thyroid disease, and up to 60% of those uh, don't know that they actually have uh, any kind of a thyroid issue. So it's a big issue, and again, especially here in Amarillo, it seems like it's a, there's a lot of um, thyroid issues. We see a ton in our practice. But on the flip side, though, um, you know, there's been a study done in 2021 that showed um, kind of a meta-analysis of 17 different studies that show up to 30% of patients can actually come off their thyroid medications. And so maybe sometimes, you know, integrated medicine, we, we can sometimes tend to over-treat thyroid and they don't actually need the thyroid medication. And so we want to keep, kind of keep a balanced approach to things. Um, and then, of course, the patients that are on thyroid, even if their TSH is well-controlled, Five to ten percent, at least. Some research shows up to even up forty percent can still have symptoms for varying different reasons. So we'll talk about some of these things uh, during this webinar. Just some of the basics here. So just the anatomy. The thyroid traditionally looks like a little butterfly. Um, it has like two different lobes that wrap, wrap around the, the trachea. They're in the neck, um, and so you can shouldn't really be able to feel it unless it's enlarged. Um, but that is where it's at. Um, just keep in mind that the brain sends a signal hypothalamus to the pituitary down to the thyroid. So the HPA axis, um, we talk about, of course, kind of the endocrine axis. And um, making sure y'all can hear me. It looks like things are working. But that is where it's at. Okay. So it is working here. All right. But if y'all have any questions, just feel free to shout out there. But 
Um, so we talk about T4, of course, that's the pro-hormone. It's also known as thyroxine. It's the most abundant hormone. 80% is excreted by the thyroid gland, uh, but it's inactivated and it has to be converted at T3, which is more that kind of pep in your step. And so it acts as a kind of reservoir um, from that T4 to T3 conversion. And so, of course, we test that um, on the te lab test, of course, free T4, free T3. Um, there, of course, levothyroxine is also a hormone, so we can obviously use that as a medication. So whether it's brand name, Synthroid, Levoxyl, um, Tyrosin is a more pure version, but it has a much longer half-life, so you know technically it's a little safer to use um, than something that has T3 in it. And triiodothyroxine, of course, is T3. That's the more powerful hormone in the body. You know, again, that gives you the kind of pep in your step, and it's the one that's responsible for weight loss, hair growth, metabolism, all the things that thyroid is responsible for. Um, you know, but it only produces, the thyroid only produces about 20% of T3. Uh, T4 is converted to T, uh, T3 to become that kind of active hormone. And so, of course, we can test free, three, free T3, total T3 as a lab test, um, but we can also, you know, prescribe it as a medication, uh, cytomel, le leothyroxine, um, or the, some of the natural desiccated thyroids will have it in there. But it has a much shorter half-life, um, but it's also more potent than the T4 medications. And... Um, so when we look at uh, reverse T3, this is kind of the brake pedal. So the gas pedal is the free T3, reverse T3 is the brake pedal. And so, you know, trying to find this balance. And so a lot of docs don't test for this. It can be really helpful, especially kind of fine tuning thyroid. I don't check it every time, but uh, it can be helpful when you're trying to problem solve if someone's still having thyroid issues or thyroid symptoms when they're on medication. And so when we start talking about conversion, um, you know, again, that brain talks, which is the TSH, um, tells the thyroid to produce hormones. And of course, 80% in that T4 version, 20% uh, in the T3. But that T4 in the body, uh, more peripherally in the, in the cells, can get re converted into either reverse T3 or free T3. And so how do we shift it over to more free T3 versus the reverse T3? And that's these um, deiodinase enzymes. Um, we talk about uh, there's D2, D3, and D1. You know, D2 is 80% of the conversion. Hello, Lee. I see you tuned in. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Rita. Hi, Lynn. Um, hi, Angel. Hi, Ann. Looks like we have a few people that are kind of turn, tuning in. Um, but 80% of the T4 gets converted to T3 by the D2. Uh, only 20% gets converted by D1. Uh, and then the D3 is the inactivating. Um, it's going to convert T4 to reverse T3. And it's also going to break down free T3 quicker to T2. And so that's kind of the, the, the break, the, you know, the turn off enzyme. Uh, and so we talk about um, the D1 for short, the deiodinase 1. Again, of course, it's very sensitive to physical and emotional stress. And so, you know, obviously stress affects 70 to 85 percent of all office visits we see are stress related. And we don't really realize how much it really impacts us on a daily basis. I mean, stress can be motivating up to a certain point, but it can definitely, if um, left unchecked, and you know, it, it can have a huge impact on our bodies. And so we talk about insulin resistance, so making sure you have good blood blood sugar control, leptin resistance, depression, diabetes, you know, autoimmunity, different dieting, environmental toxicants. Wow. They'll all suppress D1, which then that results in lower T3 levels. Uh, and so that's again where we start getting kind of some of this euthyroid sick and some of these other things that our body kind of shuts down itself to, to it knows it's under stress and so it tries to alleviate. Um, and so um, D2, again, that's more, uh, it's another kind of activating, you know, uh, but that's going to convert T4 into active T3. Um, and that's again about 70% of T3 production. That's more found in the brain versus D1 is found in the body. And so in the brain, we, if we have a bunch of T3 in the brain, body thinks that we have enough production, it's going to turn off production. And so uh, as D1 gets activated, um, which again is going to suppress res the uh, production of T3 in the body, on the cells, uh, uh, on the flip side, D2 usually gets um, uh, increased. And so that will actually downregulate our body's production. And so the same thing, so physical, emotional stress, those kind of things, and so it has the same effect, but that's more on the brain versus the body. Um, so the, really the big difference is one works on the peripheral tissues and one works on the pituitary. Uh, so we're getting a little bit in the weeds on some of this stuff, but it's good to sometimes have an understanding of these things. The D3 um, 
Again, that's the one that kind of turns off things. So it's going to convert T4 into the inactivated uh, reverse T3 and stimulates that T3 into the less active form T2. And so what does this? Well, it's going to be things like inflammation, gut dysbiosis. If you're fasting too much, you know, you're, if you're dropping your, your, your um, calories or your carbs, you know, if you're going to more ketogenic and dropping it below 25% or so, um, you know, selenium deficiencies and other nutritional deficiencies, insulin resistance, obesity, you know, these are all things that can impair uh, D1, D2 uh, function, and this is how our body regulates itself. So, you know, of course the question is, well, how do we increase that, that conversion from T4 into the more active T3 and not shunting down the reverse T3 pathway? So if someone has a nutritional deficiency like zinc or selenium, um, obviously those can be really helpful. We talk about you know, the thyroid, you know, four molecules of tyrosine, four molecules of iodine. So again, in the right person, those can be really helpful. And that's what a lot of the thyroid supplements out there are based off is more of a sluggish thyroid. It's, you know, trying to boost up thyroid that way. Of course, you can obviously also take medicines that have T3. That's going to bypass the conversion. And so again, if you have too much reverse T3, taking free T3 will kind of bypass that somewhat. Let's jump into some of the different thyroid diseases. So we, we talk about Hashimoto's, kind of just a general catch-all of thyroid dysfunction, and then hypothyroidism. And so, you know, we're not really going to talk about hyperthyroidism, but there's a balance there. And so the vast percentage of people are more hypothyroid uh, than hyperthyroid. But Hashimoto's is, it's an autoimmune destruction of the thyroid. And so it's, of course, for some reason, our body's attacked itself uh, and attacked the thyroid specifically. And so why is that? And of course, left untreated or left, you know, if it doesn't get resolved, can cause, you know, overt hypothyroidism where people need medications. But not everybody with Hashimoto's needs thyroid medicines. And of course, our goal is to try to prevent people from needing thyroid medicines. Um, but people with one autoimmune condition like Hashimoto's is also at risk for developing other autoimmune conditions, and which can cause low stomach acid and of course, then um, are at increased risk for iron deficiency for a number of different reasons. But so only, you know, uh, out of the 20% of the population that have Hashimoto's, only about 1% have hypothyroidism and actually needing medication. So that's the good news. And of course, there's always hope for healing. And so, but the biggest question with integrative medicine is what's the antecedents, the genetics, the family history, and there are certain genetics that factor into the thyroid. Um, you know, family history definitely plays into that. What's the triggering event, you know, wasn't quite the same since, and what's the mediators? Why is our body not getting back to that default state of health? And so, again, we talked a little bit about stress, one of the more common things that can trigger Hashimoto's, um, different viral infections, and we'll talk about HHV6 versus Epstein-Barr and different infections um, like Yersinia and, of course, if a leaky gut. And, um, you know, obviously pregnancy can be a big change in the immune system, different radiation exposure. If you get too much iodine, um, there's... Um, you know, iodine is a very finicky molecule. Too much or too little of anything is not very good, but iodine especially. And it seems like there's a big camp. Um, David Brownstein has published a lot of different books. Of course, he lives up in the Great Lakes area. And so in that area, they probably are a little more iodine deficient and needing higher dosing. But the vast majority of people do not need high doses of iodine. In fact, it can be kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. People that th think that they have thyroid issues start taking super high doses of iodine. It actually then creates thyroid issues they feel like they're validated, but um, ultimately what the deal was was potentially not the thyroid issue in the first place and that they just kind of added insult to injury there. So we do want to get to the root causes of all these things. Um, of course, food allergies, you know, food's going to be your best medicine or slowest poison there. And so a huge thing we want to address and um, one of the best places to start with um, total body healing. Um, of course, we, we try to look at some of the antibodies, um, the elevated thyroglobulin antibodies versus thyroid peroxidase. Thyroglobulin is very interesting because it's not as uh, specific for Hashimoto's. Thyroid peroxidase is more showing actual damage of the thyroid, so that's the one that is more we're more concerned about. Um, you know, and so again, but the good news is that even with people that have elevated antibodies, um, unless they were above 500, we really didn't see a significant increase in people's TSHs over time. Um, now, that being said, of course, you know, lower the better, and we don't want, we don't want to get above 500. We don't want to even be above 100, but, um, you know, typically if we can get below 100, that's kind of pretty well controlled. But usually mo most reference ranges are about in the mid-30s um, as considered your normal level. 
Um, and again, remember that over a nine year follow up, only nine to 19 percent of people actually converted into hypothyroidism. You know, a lot of docs, of course, will, you know, kind of wait and kind of see if any symptoms develop or, you know, if the thyroid gets destroyed before starting medication. Um, but again, I'm trying to be a little more proactive to um, be, uh, you know, nip things in the bud before you become, you know, need thyroid medication. And even if, again, like I said, you know, even if you are on thyroid medication, we, we take a lot of people off of thyroid medication that they're able to wean down and, you know, if we get to the root cause of things. But um, it just kind of depends on uh, how long it's been going on and a lot of different factors there. But as an integrative approach, again, for Hashimoto's, we try to, you know, change the diet. We get rid of different foods that the body may be having some issues with. And of course, supplementation of anything that uh, they may be deficient in. Of course, if they need medication, sometimes we'll use medication like low dose naltrexone that can help kind of reset the immune system a little bit. And a big one is definitely affects, uh, addressing the gut dis dysfunction there. And there's been a few papers recently that have been published showing how much of a correlation gut dysfunction is with thyroid issues. And um, so when we talk about thyroid dysfunction as a general kind of catch-all, you know, there's lots of different causes. Uh, we mentioned a lot of these different things. And so again, this is more of like a euthyroid sick that it's more on a cellular level. Um, there's lots of different reasons that the thyroid can be off. Um, and so again, getting to that root cause. We talk about subclinical hypothyroidism. That's a hot topic. And, you know, a lot of docs are now actually prescribing medication for subclinical hypothyroidism. And sometimes I do too. Again, of course, it's shared decision making with patients to see if they benefit from it. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's all about kind of, um, you know, it's their body, their choice. And so just trying to work through things. But um, if they're obviously feeling lousy, it's nice to get them feeling better um, as we're kind of diving into that more root cause. But essentially, of course, having an elevated TSH, and of course, it's again, remember, it's an inverse relationship. The, the brain is screaming at the thyroid to kind of keep up. So we get that TSH that goes up, uh, but the normal T4, which is, of course, the thyroid itself. But the, the vast majority of people with uh, subcl subclinical hypothyroidism, um, when the, the TSH is mildly elevated, don't really benefit from thyroid medication. Now, sometimes if they're a little younger or if they're pregnant or that they're having some infertility, those are the ones that have the research has shown that they potentially benefit a little bit more. But that being said is that patients that are untreated and that they do have subclinical hypothyroidism do actually have an increased mortality because again, there is something that's causing the thyroid to go awry. But again, remember that the actual replacement didn't decrease the risk of death. So that's interesting because it's not the root cause. So again, it's all get about getting back to the root cause. Um, and of course, again, um, just being cautious and not getting too high of a dose causing um, hyperthyroidism, which can cause arrhythmias and bone loss and issues there. But um, subclinical hypothyroidism does convert two to five percent per year. Again, if you don't get to that root cause, or it doesn't go, it doesn't correct. When we talk about overt hypothyroidism, uh, again, of course, the most common symptoms: it's you know fatigue, hair loss, coldness, muscle aches and pains, brain fog, depression, problems losing weight. And so, fatigue is the most common symptom we see. Eighty-one percent of patients with hypothyroidism have fatigue. Um, you know, hair loss is thirty percent, dry skin sixty to seventy percent feeling cold, 60%, mood imbalances, 46%, you know, and so the list kind of goes on. But the problem is that those are a lot of vague symptoms, and so that can be overlapping with iron deficiency or, you know, again, maybe anxiety, depression, you know, mind, body, spirit, it's all connected. So, again, it's just trying to figure out what that root cause is. And, you know, it may or may not be reversible, and hopefully it can be reversed, but not always, and it depends on how long it's been going on. But it's trying to dive deeper into that root cause of what's going on. So when you start looking at tests, uh, we talk about, of course, getting a little more comprehensive lab testing. We want to get not only that TSH, but we want to get free T4, free T3, sometimes even, you know, total T3, total T4, reverse T3, um, you know, the thyroid antibodies. Sometimes we'll get sex hormone binding globulin or kind of an AM cortisol to look at the adrenals. Um, a lot of docs, of course, just do kind of a TSH for a screening test, which, you know, for some people, and again, for cash pay patients, a lot of times we will just do a TSH to, to get the worst of the worst. But if we're really having a lot of symptoms and it's screaming thyroid, it's probably best to do a little more thorough testing because obviously you can't, you know, with the TSH alone, you're not going to get that conversion issues, some of the receptor issues, or, you know, again, I see a lot of people that have antibodies that the thyroid is technically okay for a long period of time until it kind of burns out. And so... 
it's good to catch those early on rather than later. And so when you start talking about normal, you know, normal is relative. So not everywhere is a size eight shoe. You know, do you like your thermostat 68 or 72? There's not a right answer. Um, it's what's best for you. And so genetically, some people run a little higher on the TSH, but they show that, of course, again, up to 30% of people who have a TSH greater than three have un undiagnosed autoimmune issues, you know, but, and we see that people that live the longest, you know, centurions have higher levels of thyroid hormone compared to younger groups. So probably more optimal, we do want to be on those more optimal, higher levels of some of these and, you know, TSH probably closer to one, the better, but, um, you know, again, it's normal as relative. So it can be on the east end of the Grand Canyon and the west end of the Grand Canyon and still in the Grand Canyon, but totally two different perspectives. So when we look at optimal levels, TSH, we're talking about 0.5 to 2.5. The free T4 typically shooting for 1 to 1.4 and free T3 shooting for 3 to 3.6. You know, of course, huge reference ranges. And, you know, again, so um, just keep that in mind. Reverse T3 typically like to see less than 15. Um, again, the labs typically don't flag that until it's about 25. And then the antibodies, again, um, it depends on the lab company. Sometimes they talk about 100. Sometimes they talk about 0.9 for like LabCorp. Um, you know, 34 is kind of a usual cutoff. Um, and we're, I'm more concerned about TPO than thyroid globulin, but they're both important <clears throat> and um, can show damage of the thyroid. We talk about sex hormone, sex hormone binding globulin, and so that's an interesting one. We'll frequently check it when we're checking other hormones like testosterone or estrogen, but the liver produces that. Um, it binds to um, hormones uh, to keep to help shift the free availability. So um, depending on how much estrogen someone has, if the estrogen levels are stable, then it can be a good sign of an indicator of more thyroid imbalance. And so if we have a low sex hormone binding globulin um, due to hypothyroidism, it should increase once you start uh, thyroid medication and get things more balanced. Um, now, if you don't see an increase, then of course you kind of have to dive in a little deeper and kind of see maybe the dose isn't optimized or something else is going on because there's multiple different reasons that will and things that will affect sex, horm sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG. Um, Cortisol, of course, we talk about it's all connected. So the brain talks to the thyroid, that talks to the adrenals, that talks to the ovaries. And so adrenals and thyroid, they, they play hand in hand there. And so you can do kind of a spot check in the morning uh, just on blood testing, you know, between 10 and 20 is probably a little more optimal, but, you know, doing a Dutch testing where we can get kind of a four point throughout the day, that's going to be a little more helpful. Uh, sometimes we'll check TSI, the thyroid, thyroid stimulating uh, immunoglobulin. This is having to do with more hyperthyroidism, um, diagnosing graves. And so again, unless someone has a lot of symptoms of hyperthyroidism, then we wouldn't typically check it, but it's just another antibody showing autoimmunity. Remember that when you're testing for thyroid, if you're taking anything that has T3, and if you're going to be testing for T3, you really want to hold off on taking your morning thyroid. Also remember that biotin can interact with the lab test. It doesn't actually interfere with in the thyroid hormones in your body. It's only how the test is getting ran. So it's, um, but it will give you a false sense of hyperthyroidism. And so it can make things a little more confusing when you look at the labs. So ideally, if you're taking anything with a multivitamin or something that for hair growth to hold off on taking biotin for a couple days. And then women that are still menstruating, um, again, if we can avoid testing kind of day 10 to day 20, when, you know, progesterone and other things are kind of ramping up, that will affect some of the thyroid testing as well. And so that's ideal to avoid that time frame. And again, here's just so, some of those different more optimal ranges that we mentioned on all of these different uh, lab values. Some of the different patterns we'll see. So, of course, we'll see, you know, high TSH, normal T4, normal T3. That's more, again, kind of uh, subclinical hypothyroidism that we mentioned previously. You can get high TSH, the brain screaming at the thyroid, normal, normal T4, but then low T3. And so, again, if you're not looking at the conversion and you were just checking a TSH and, and a T4, you'll miss out on that conversion issues. And so they may need some more zinc or, you know, some of the different cofactors that are converting things. Um, if they have a normal TSH but low free T4, low T3, that's more, um, of course, youth thyroid sick or something going on with the brain. The brain's shutting off the thyroid. It's trying to downregulate. Um, you can get normal TSH, normal T4, uh, low T3. Of course, we talked about that above, but that's also youth thyroid sick. Um, you know, people with uh, 
uh, that are overweight can sometimes get this and you know that can cause some issues there too of course you can get the normal labs but positive antibodies so that's the early uh, Hashimoto's and so they can be totally symptomatic and have all the same low thyroid symptoms um, and sometimes it will do a trial of medication that can help lower down the antibodies quicker um, uh, Angel, you were saying, yes, biotin will definitely help out with hair growth. Um, but what I was talking about there, it can also interfere with the thyroid uh, lab test. So just around um, when you're getting your thyroid checked, you just want to hold off on taking it uh, for a couple of days. Uh, not saying it's, uh, again, it's not a negative thing against the thyroid. It's just on the testing itself, just how we run the molecular test. Um, it messes it up uh, outside the body, not inside the body. Uh, it has no interaction in, inside the body as far as with the thyroid goes. And again, can be great for hair loss and, and other things if you need it. Of course, it's kind of a B vitamin. And, uh, but um, uh, Let's talk about 10 reasons why you may still have hypothyroid sy symptoms. And so number one, of course, maybe you're not on the right medication. There's different classes. And so, you know, the synthetic only T4 versus the combination T4 plus T3. And then there's T3 only more of a... Uh, you know, there's synthetic versus glandular. And so there's some debates about, you know, synthetic versus glandular. There was a big study done, a meta analysis in, in 2019, uh, when I say big, of course, 348 individuals, but over 50% preferred the combination versus just T4 alone. And this is probably, again, going back to the people that genetically don't convert T4 to T3 as well, which is only about 10% of people that have hypothyroidism. So you know, again, probably the vast majority of people would do just fine on T4, but it seems like a lot of patients have already tried that that come see us. Uh, and so we um, give a trial of potentially some of the glandulars. Um, you know, you may not be taking enough thyroid medication. So again, of course, if you're still having all the low thyroid symptoms, fatigue, constipation, dry skin, hair loss, coldness, muscle aches and pains, brain fog, depression, problems losing weight, you probably need a little more thyroid. Um, or there's still something that's sabotaging you. And maybe there is, again, more static in the line. that The brain's not sending a strong enough signal to that thyroid. And so, you know, we can ramp up the thyroid a little bit to kind of get them in that Goldilocks zone. Because ultimately, we treat you, not the labs. But we want to keep the labs in a, in a decent range. And so, again, sometimes the thyroid symptoms are not thyroid at, at all. And so, of course, if you're not sleeping, you're not healing, making sure you don't have sleep apnea. You know, again, chronic fatigue, of course, kind of waste basket diagnosis. So many different reasons that cause that, that fatigue and thyroid is one of them. Um, same thing with fibromyalgia. That's kind of a waste basket diagnosis. Um, and again, so a lot of times we got to get the gut right is a big thing. And so there can be either a deficiency that we're missing, you know, zinc deficiency, um, of course, iron deficiency, anemia. It can have a lot of the same thyroid symptoms, you know, hair loss, coldness, um, brain fog, depression. Um, you know, all of those things can be mimickers of low thyroid. Uh, and just even obesity can cause um, some of the thyroid symptoms there as well. So um, you may have autoimmune thyroiditis and again, so potentially normal lab tests, but those, if you have regulated the thyroid test, but you still have high levels of antibodies that can cause dysregulation of the thyroid. And so we wanna definitely try to reverse that if at all possible. You may not be absorbing your medication. And so, most people are going to take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, but you can take it in the bed uh, in the evening. And I do have some patients that even sleep better with taking the thyroid in the evening. Um, so there's some studies on that. And um, of course, again, making sure you're not taking it with any other over-the-counter supplements, you know, like Tums or whatever, calcium, iron, th those are going to bind and decrease the absorption. And so just want to keep an eye on things there. You may have, of course, some gut dysfunction. And so if you are having some gut issues, definitely want to try to get those resolved. You know, and you may still have symptoms because your labs just aren't optimized. You know, you, your TSH may need to, um, you know, need to get that a little bit lower. You may need to get the free T4 a little higher, you know. Um, but uh, what we're really looking at is, of course, on the receptor level, and, and we don't really have a test for that. And so that's why we really go more based off of testing or uh, uh, symptoms versus the tests. But we do want to keep those tests in kind of a, a good range. But um, ideally, again, TSH closer to one, the better, probably free T4, one to 1.4, free T3, three to 3.6. Um, we want to keep that reverse T3 less than 15 to have that free T3 to reverse T3 ratio uh, in a good ratio. Um, again, of course, may have some untreated nutritional deficiencies. So getting those treated, 
you may be on other medications. So maybe you're on a beta blocker for your heart. Maybe you're um, taking, you know, amitriptyline for, for sleep or headaches. Um, you may have some, uh, be on antibiotics, the Cipro, you know, uh, amniodarone can also definitely th mess up with the thyroid. We talk about, of course, um, lithium messing with the thyroid. So there's lots of different medicines that can potentially mess with the thyroid. So um, you have to kind of a, a dose adjust accordingly. If you are overweight, of course, that can definitely worsen your thyroid function and it's kind of chicken or the egg. Did the, th the thyroid cause the weight issues or did the weight cause the thyroid issues? Um, and so, of course, definitely, you know, doing as much as you can to lose the weight and getting as healthy as possible there. Of course, there are definitely people, uh, up to 10% of people that have gene involvement for sure that um, affect the, the iodinase enzymes uh, and, and so that will alter and um, affect your metabolism there. Let's jump into the five R's of healing Hashimoto's. And so Isabella Wentz, um, you know, she's a pharmacist and she's written several different books on Hashimoto's and, and I like her books. And, um, you know, this is kind of based a little bit on her books, but in Hippocrates, of course, I like the, his uh, quote, you know, all disease begins in the gut. And so we really focus on to really the, one of the biggest fo focuses on healing Hashimoto's is fixing that gut. And so we see that with people with food sensitivities, you know, 71% of those that followed a gluten withdrawal had normalization of their subclinical hypothyroidism. But that's not to say that, you know, so only 9% of over 12,000 patients that had non-celiac gluten sensitivity had Hashimoto's. So it doesn't go, um, you know, just because you have gluten sensitivity doesn't mean you're going to develop Hashimoto's. Just because you have Hashimoto's doesn't mean you're going to be gluten sensitive, but it is something to pay attention to. Of course, that's why a lot of times we'll do um, food sensitivity testing to be more um, specific for each individual versus just kind of a blanket statement. But, um, you know, even just doing a low carbohydrate diet doesn't necessarily mean um, gluten elimination was able to reduce antibodies by up to 44%. We've talked a little bit about nutritional deficiencies. Of course, selenium is probably the biggest one. And that by itself in some studies showing reduction up to, of, up to 50% of the antibodies within three months. Other studies show that it's only effective at lowering antibodies when you combine it with um, um, inositol. And so, you know, a lot of times we encourage taking uh, inositol and specifically myo uh, inositol, which is good for hormonal balancing as well for women with PCOS and other things for infertility, um, blood sugar regulation, anxiety, um, a whole slew of things. But um, uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, helps regulate immune system. And I see people with MS and uh, even cancers, other things that if we can optimize their vitamin D, that helps shut down that autoimmunity. But 92% of patients with Hashimoto's were deficient in vitamin D and 20% reduction in TPO antibodies after getting on adequate levels of vitamin D. You can do kind of a ratio um, uh, of looking at free T4 to TSH. Uh, that can be a marker of vitamin A inadequacy. And so sometimes you do need some extra vitamin A. Now keep in mind that vitamin A can be teratogenic. So if you are able to get pregnant in the childbearing ages, you want to make sure you don't, your vitamin A, you're, you're, you're doing, taking precautions if you're doing a higher dose vitamin A. We talk about intestinal permeability and that up to 54% of hypothyroid patients can suffer from SIBO. And so again, if your gut's not right, your body's not right. Maybe there's toxins that are impairing your, your detox abilities. And so we talk about lots of different pesticides, dioxins, um, you know, different sunscreens, whatever, perchlorate um, that are going to inhibit and cause uh, thyroid dysfunction. So, you know, right now we're doing our life renewed program. We focused on detoxification a few times a year. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know if you use tap water or uh, well water, but making sure uh, if you have too much fluoride, that will inhibit. Um, so we talk about the halogen uh, um, elements, fluoride and iodine are in the same column. And so they compete. And so there's bromide, fluoride, uh, chlorine, um, you know, and iodine. You know, and so again, we get some competition there. And so if you get too much fluoride, it can cause some hypothyroidism. If you do have any kind of chronic infection, so specifically that has been studied, blastocystis hominis, which is a parasite, 41% um, of patients with um, active HHV6, a virus, can cause thyroid antibodies, um, Yersinia e. coli, uh, intercoccus, or um, intercolitica, um, that uh, is another one that's uh, notorious for causing thyroid issues. We talk about hormone imbalances, and so women with low melatonin, of course, melatonin goes down as we age, but that can help improve thyroid function. 
Um, of course, testosterone, DHEA, the more anabolic um, hormones can also affect um, uh, thyroid production. And again, it's all connected there. And so if you are in a lower, low hormone state, getting those optimized can help optimize the thyroid. So if you do have an immune imbalance, of course, TH1, TH2, we start talking about um, some of the imbalances there. Uh, the, uh, one of the main things that we talk about is cordyceps. Uh, Corbin is one brand name, and it showed a drop of 51% of TPO uh, and 39% of the thyroglobulin antibodies. Sometimes we do low-dose naltrexone. Um, yeah, I've seen good results with that for different autoimmune conditions. It seems like people either respond to it or they don't. And so, you know, giving it a few weeks trial, seeing how that people feel, you know, low level laser therapy, um, you know, just topically over the thyroid. Um, and sometimes people do topical Boswellia or other anti-inflammatory things, but, um, laser has been shown to, um, reduce thyroid dosage up to 47% are able to even stop medication and that a drop of, uh, TPO is by about 31%. So something to think about there. Very, uh, of course, benign and easy thing to do. Um, we talk about, you know, if you have more TPO antibodies, it could be more environmental pollutants, um, different infections, vitamin D, selenium, but more thyroglobulin antibodies is probably more uh, iodine or mercury. Those are some trends that we tend to see, but, you know, those are, those are definitely not absolutes by any point, at any mean. Um, and so the first R of healing Hashimoto's is remove. And so, uh, of course, that would be any food triggers, toxins, infections, excess iodine fluoride um, you know again if uh, a big you know a lot of people are big proponents of iodine with thyroid and it can be helpful in the right person but if you have Hashimoto's and autoimmune issues it can sometimes add gas to the fire if you're not getting enough antioxidants uh, and so um, after three months 78 percent of people were able to go back to a euthyroid state meaning that their thyroid normalized and that their free t4 actually increased 23 percent the TSH dropped 32 percent um, and that's just being three months off of iodine. So uh, again, gluten and food sensitivities can definitely cause more of a leaky gut, cause issues there. Um, gut infections, again, of course, bacterial, fungal, parasitic. Um, if you're not digesting your food, you may need some digestive enzymes. And so an interesting study looking at H. pylori dropped TPO antibodies pretty significantly. And H. pylori, you know, there's, um, is a bad guy. One in three people can, can get it in their lifetime. And so just, um, you know, we do, we check for that a lot. Uh, you know, we want to make sure we're repairing that gut lining. And so that can be done with a lot of different things. There's kind of a, I mean, a lot of times we'll use G GI benefits, which is, has glutamine, aloe vera, ravaglycans, DGL, has some zinc carnosine, um, and can help, of course, better absorption. Replace any kind of digestive enzymes that may need or, di you know, different nutritional supplements. You know, again, iron's a big one with thyroid, but of course, so is selenium and, and B12. Uh, and um, zinc, vitamin A, all of those good things. So just making sure we get all those replaced. Re-inoculating with some good probiotics. Um, and so prebiotics versus probiotics, you know, of course they can both be helpful. Um, prebiotics feed the probiotics. And so uh, you can do natural, you know, things like yogurt, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, all of those kind of things that are fermented. Um, and uh, rebalance. And so we're trying to rebalance the immune system. Um, that's with, you know, things like cordyceps, the lowest naltrexone, um, different adrenal adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha um, can be helpful. And so let's move on to just kind of some general suggestions here. Um, so kind of the, the foundational or the, or the kind of summary of things, you know, foods can be your best medicine, your slowest poison, avoiding processed foods and refined sugars. They did some studies on, again, artificial sweeteners that um, case reports of inducing autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, avoiding soy, you know, so that's a lot of times we talk about soy being uh, a goitrogenic food that can cause low thyroid. But at the same time, there's an interesting study on um, ginstein that actually helped lower down the antibodies. Maybe that's doing because it's suppressing the thyroid some. Um, but in general, we typically avoid soy with, with thyroid issues. Of course, if we're going to eat organic, we could talk about... Um, uh, clean 15 versus the dirty dozen, you know, filtered water, um, making sure, you know, not getting a bunch of um, uh, chlorine in your water um, or fluoride, fluoride even. Um, again, those interfere with thyroid function. Autoimmune uh, protocol diet, um, you know, MSQ is, is, we use that on our initial patient intake to kind of gauge 
how toxic someone is. Um, but it, um, it's kind of just a review of systems. It's given a, it's a bunch of different questions, a medical survey questionnaire. And so it dropped it pretty significantly. CRP is a, is a marker of inflammation. And so it drops that doing that diet, autoimmune protocol diet, uh, dropped CRP by 29%, but it didn't really see any change in thyroid function. So it's interesting. Um, you know, it didn't really help thyroid, but, um, which is interesting because autoimmune protocol is gluten-free. And so there's other studies that show that gluten-free can potentially help lower down uh, thyroid antibodies. So anyhow, kind of a, a nuance there, but, um, you know, green tea, um, that's, of course, this is a rat study, but it showed to help um, uh, increase uh, or decrease uh, TPO um, antibodies. Um, when you start talking about supplements, thiamine, B1, of course, that's been shown in high doses of it, 600 milligrams, so it's a pretty high dose. Uh, it can help out with fatigue in three to five days. 200 micrograms of selenium. Selenium can be toxic, so you don't want to get too much of it. Brazil nuts is a very common source of, of selenium, so that's a good source. Um, we talked about, of course, again, combining myo-inositol with selenium if you're going to do it. And so uh, that is most of the studies show that that other synergistic and uh, can make a big impact on dropping antibodies there. Vitamin D, we talked about a little bit, again, reducing thyroid antibodies by 20% and B12. You know, iron is needed for the production of that thyroid peroxase. Um, you know, of course, that's the enzyme that's used to make your um, thyroid hormones, which, again, we talk about thyroid peroxase antibodies, you know, the destruction of those. Uh, cells. And so we definitely want to make sure we have adequate iron. We talk about a ferritin, ideally at least 50 to 85, you know, definitely anybody below 35 is going to have symptoms. You can get ADHD symptoms, you know, brain fog, uh, of course, hair loss. Um, we start talking about, um, of course, just more fatigue and uh, things there. But um, if two thirds of women without anemia, you know, so again, most people with low ferritins do not have actually full blown anemia. Um, but if they still have symptoms of high th hypothyroidism, low thyroid, um, if you got them above 100, which is, that's a pretty high level of ferritin, we don't typically have to get that high, but it ameliorated their symptoms. Um, we talked a little bit about vitamin A, so the 25,000 international units, which is definitely a higher dose, anything above 10,000 international units a day of vitamin A can be teratogenic, so you want to be care careful about that, but that helped reduce TSH by 29%, increase T3, um, by 38%. You want to make sure you have adequate zinc to copper ratios, and um, you know um, that can also be helpful. Moving on to the herbs, so ashwagandha, which is kind of more adrenal adaptogenic herb, uh, can improve TSH or excuse me T3 by 18% and T4 um, by 111% just after 20 days. Bacoba, uh, this was a mouse study, uh, helped improve thyroid function. Uh, that's good for brain function. We typically use that for more cognitive issues with brain fog. Um, genistein. So again, we mentioned a little bit about avoiding soy previously. This study actually showed 600 milligrams of genistein, a purified extract of soy, not, not soy in the whole sense, but after one month in, increased uh, free T4 by 45% uh, and TSH dropped by 31% and thyroid antibodies dropped by 28 and uh, thyroglobulin antibodies dropped by 42%. So that's pretty powerful. Um, so sometimes we will consider genistein by itself. It definitely tends to be a little more pricier, um, but that extract of soy. And aloe is a very interesting thing. That it, Why is that helping the thyroid? Well, of course, again, if we can heal that gut, about 50 mLs, if you're doing more of a juice, a liquid, uh, twice a day for nine months, showed a, a decrease in the TSH and a 54% reduction in TPO antibodies and also increasing free T4. Um, and so... Um, you may want to consider different testing. So diving into that root cause, you know, food sensitivity testing, heavy metal testing. The NutriVal dives a lot into a lot of different things. It's looking at organic acids, fatty acids, um, you know, some of the minerals, some of the heavy metals, some of the toxicity markers. So we frequently will start with both food sensitivity and NutriVal testing. Now, NutriVal testing is looking at more recent exposure. So the heavy metal testing, sometimes we have to dive deeper into that to look at more total body burden and do actually a, a urine provocation test um, to try to pull deeper out of that tissue. Again, if your gut's not right, your body's not right. So if, you know, definitely if you have any gut dysfunction, after doing some of the food sensitivity testing, you may want to do stool testing. Again, so if you're going through menopause or you feel like your hormones are off, Dutch testing can be really helpful. Um, and of course, sometimes doing imaging to make sure there's no nodules or other things going on. And um, we can do thyroid ultrasounds right in our office. 
um, and even um, thermography. We do that a lot for breast thermography. And at the same time we're doing breast thermography, we're also typically looking at the thyroid as well. Um, if you're, you know, uh, needing medications, of course, you know, glandulars versus synthetic. Um, you can do compound uh, synthetic, sustain release, so it's lasting more throughout the day. Um, you know, there's echothyroid, which is bovine derived versus porcine derived is prescription. That's going to be armor, nature throid. Um, you know, nature throid uh, has been a little harder to get. Um, they've had some issues with supply. Um, there's also tyrosine, which is more of a um, liposomal form of T4 in, in a gel cap. And so sometimes a little bit better absorbed. And interesting enough, metformin has been shown to reduce antibodies um, with people with Hashimoto's. So if you have diabetes, and sometimes we just do metformin for more anti-aging purposes. But again, that's shared decision-making with patients. Uh, metformin can deplete B12 levels, and so you just have to weigh the pros and the cons of that. Um, for those of you guys that may be tuning in that aren't local um, and trying to find a local doctor, of course, we're happy to help you at Well Life. Um, and, uh, but um, if you're not living in Amarillo, uh, you may, of course, you know, find out, you know, of course, questions to ask your doc are, you know, are they, or trying to get a sense if they're willing to try something new and they're willing to listen to you, spend the time with you, because it takes time to dive into some of this stuff to figure out what that root cause is and just being a, kind of a medical detective uh, and helping you through your journey. Uh, are they willing to use thyroid medications other than levothyroxine? Some, some endocrinologists, some docs, they're diehard, you know, levothyroxine or nothing, um, and again, levothyroxine works for a vast percentage of patients, but the at least 10%, you know, and up to 50% prefer more glandulars over just the synthetic. Um, and again, of course, making sure they're doing more than just a TSH, at least initially, you know, I, a lot of times for follow-up testing, I'll just do a free T4 and a TSH um, if patients are somewhat regulated, um, you know, just to save on cost for patients because they do get more expensive. But if they have thyroid symptoms and and it's worth um, to actually do a TSH. It's probably worth to do a complete panel. And some of the tips and tricks to find a good doc locally. Of course, if you t talk with compounding pharmacists, because you know again, uh, the docs that are prescribing compounding farm, you know, thyroid medicines are going to, you know, they're going to be more attuned to thyroid issues. Of course, there's different integrated medicine groups: uh, A4M, ACAM. The, probably my favorite group is IFM, Institute of Functional Medicine. You know, all these different groups. If you get on their website. Um, you can find some of their members. Of course, those members have to pay their subscription dues. And so a lot of times if you just Google, you know, integrated medicine, your town, um, or functional medicine, your town, um, you know, that's a good way. Of course, obviously asking friends and family, you know, Facebook groups, whatever, um, you know, and, and finding people that have, you know, docs that have a little more certification in more integrative medicine is, but of course I'm biased, but so, you know, because of everything that we go through and, you know, all the patients that we see with Hashimoto's, we ended up creating Hashi Help. And it, it took me about a year to formulate this. Um, and so there is eight ingredients in Hashi Help, um, you know, per six capsules, capsules, we basically combine all of those things that potentially can help um, reverse some of those antibodies. So that we got the selenium in there. We got the inositol that's synergistic with the selenium. We have black cumin seed oil and uh, cordyceps, and we have N-acetylcysteine, we have curcumin for inflammation, ashwagandha for more of adrenal um, balancing. Um, Kathy, yes, we'll have potentially, uh, you can go back and watch it. I don't know if we'll have the PowerPoints um, available to look at, but um, uh, we'll reach out to us and we'll, we'll help you with that. Um, yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I tend to be a little fast talking there. And, um, trying to cram as much as I can to help you guys. But um, so it may take watching this a few times uh, to go back through. And of course, obviously we can dive into this stuff in uh, a one-on-one -on -one in a office visit as well too. But we, you know, we formulated it, it's of course made here in the US. It's hypoallergenic, we, you know, using therapeutic doses. Sometimes with supplements, they just put a bunch of things on the label, but they're small doses, they're not actually therapeutic. We have trademark ingredients like Mariva for the, the um, curcumin, so we know it works. Um, and obviously I was the one that formulated it. So, uh, you know, some of the evidence and all the, you know, uh, 30 years of knowledge of, you know, working in the integrated medicine to find the right combination. And of course it's GMP compliant. So 
we're still early on in, in studying this. We know we don't really know if there's a synergistic effect between all of these things together. You know, we know individually they work by themselves. And so, you know, the question becomes how much more potent is these things combined? And so we talk about ashwagandha, um, of course, good for a lot of different things by itself. Uh, can be used for anxiety, can help the immune system, um, you know, anti-inflammatory, neuroprotective, memory enhancing, cordyceps, that immune balancing can help out with kidney dysfunction. People with chronic kidney disease um, can help, of course, um, with some of that stuff. Curcumin is great for so many different things, you know, pre preventing diabetes, helping out with brain dysfunction, with um, dementia, Alzheimer's issues, helping, of course, with anxiety, helping it's anti-inflammatory, helping with muscle soreness. Aloe, of course, definitely great for the gut, you know, heal, you know, helps with constipation, healing the gut. And black seed oil, um, good for uh, inflammation. It's uh, uh, anti-infectious. It's uh, as effective as some diabetes meds for um, uh, lowering blood sugar, helping drop cholesterol. You know, it's good for so many different things. And so when you look at some of those different supplements, if patients are taking them individually, which is what we used to do in the past, is, um, you know, having patients giving them some options, uh, it was pretty expensive, and so that was one of the reasons why we formulated it, and just to simplify things. So obviously getting the right ratios, and so as people heal, you can potentially drop down on that dose some, and so you're not having to take all these, you know, seven pills if you do the individual supplements. You know, to start off with, a good therapeutic dose is six pills in a day for Hashi Help, three pills twice a day. You just can only cram so much in a pill. And again, of course, food first. We, you know, supplements are made to supplement the diet. They're not made to replace it. And so, again, we really want to focus on gut healing uh, but again, as an adjunct, and at least to start off with, um, you know, supplementation can be helpful. So um, that is kind of the breakdown there. So if you all have any questions, I'll stay on the line here. It's um, 1055, so we've got about five minutes here at least that I'll kind of uh, hang around. And um, I appreciate y'all, everybody that tuned in. And um, We'll definitely have the recording available for you guys that you can go back and watch if you want. Sorry, I was a little late to join in. I was trying to get my webcam to also work, for, but for some reason, I couldn't have both the PowerPoint and um, webcam on at the same time. So it's been a while since I've done a Facebook Live. And we're going to change that. So in 2023, once a month, we're going to try to do, at least every couple months, we're going to try to do a... Um, educational webinar on different things. Next month, I think we're going to try to do cardiovascular health um, for, uh, of course, heart health awareness. Um, you're welcome, Tiffany. Um, yeah, Samantha, you're asking about medications, thoughts on NP thyroid versus or echo thyroid. Um, they can both work. Um, echo thyroid, of course, is not regulated. Um, so sometimes, you know, uh, bottle to bottle, you may see some variation. You know, that's not standardized to how much uh, T4, T3 is in there. Um, in the past, actually in the 70s, they used to standardize uh, glandulars to the iodine production. Obviously, that didn't work because, again, there was huge uh, shifts in how much uh, hormone was in there. And so they had to switch it over to more of uh, how much uh, based on, you know, levothyroxine. And so, you know, the NP thyroid is a 4 to 1 ratio of T4 to T3. Echo thyroid is probably more like a 10 to 1 ratio um, just because it's bovine based. Um, and that's probably more, you know, what our humans are more kind of a, you know, eight to 10 to one of the T4 to T3. Um, and so bottom line, it's whatever works for you. Um, obviously again, a lot of docs aren't crazy about the over the counter stuff just because they're not able to control it as well. Um, but it's whatever's cheaper for you, whatever works. I'm not opposed to either one of them. Um, it's finding the right dose and making sure that, you know, number one, do you have a thyroid issue that you need to be on thyroid medicines for? And number two, if you do, then, of course, trying to get to the root cause and uh, medications if need be. Um, but the thyroid is basically a medicine, it's, it's, um, and so it should be treated as such. And so anything that can both help you can also hurt you. Uh, and so just keep that in mind. So, um, and, you know, also, you know, I get a lot of patients that say, you know, that didn't really have a thyroid issue in the first place, but they went on thyroid medicine and they feel better. And, you know, and so they think that they have a thyroid issue. And so... Yes, they can feel better on thyroid medicine um, temporarily, but that's like hitting the gas pedal on empty. People also feel better taking cocaine, but uh, we know that that's not good for us. So, um, you know, um, just keep that in mind. So just want to be um, cognizant of the decisions we make and be safe and, you know, everything with moderation. Tiffany, you're asking how to purchase Hashi Help. Um, you can get on 
just on the website. So uh, the main website is just uh, ooh, Hashi Help, Hashi-Help.com. Um, you can get, there's more information about the product um, on that website. Of course, you can get on our main website, welllifefm.com. So that's three L's, W-E-L-L-L-I-F-E, -L 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 -E, uh, FM as in familymedicine.com. Uh, we have a shop on there, so you can get it through our shop as well. Um, of course, we also have it in our uh, office. And um, uh, Tammy, you're welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Angel, you're asking about homocysteine, supreme, and thiamine, and adrenal. Uh, Hashi Help doesn't really replace those. There is some overlap. Um, adrenal does not have ashwagandha in there, but ashwagandha in the Hashi Help can definitely help. Homocysteine supreme, of course, has lots of good B vitamins. Um, Hashi Help does not have any B vitamins in there. And so, again, it's not really a replacement for the things that you're on. Uh, it can be potentially helpful um, for people with um, you know, thyroid dysfunction, though. And the bottom line is the proofs in the pudding. Typically, we'll do a three months of it at least. You know, again, it takes about three to six months to really see a change in those antibodies. Checking antibodies sooner than that really don't typically help. Uh, Carolyn, um, let's see, can we purchase all one via well life uh, Yeah, um, you can purchase uh, any of those different individual supplements or our Hashi Help. Um, on our well life site or in the office, um, yeah, without memberships, without office uh, visits, with memberships you do get some discounts, so you get 10% or 15% off, um, and so that's on online purchases only, um, and so just keep that in mind. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Robin, you're asking, can taking Hashi help be harmful if no Hashimoto's? Not really, no. I mean, again, of course, the dosing that we have in there. Um, of course, you know, if you don't need it, you shouldn't take it probably, but, uh, it can, there's, it can benefit a lot of different things. Obviously, of course, we talk about just autoimmune things in general. And so again, if, if sometimes having combination products can be helpful to, to eliminate taking so many different products, but, um, you know, if you had something that with the kind of autoimmune issue, um, you know, the cordyceps, again, immune balancing the black cumin seed oil, um, you know, the inositol is good for a lot of different things with anxiety, the detox component of NAC, the, you know, um, ashwagandha with, um, uh, you know, thyroid balancing, but, um, um, so it wouldn't necessarily be harmful, but, um, you know, probably not necessarily. Let's see. Shelly, uh, you're welcome. Thank you all for tuning in. And, um, <laughs> Thanks, Angel. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know about the best doctor. I just, you know, treat others like I want to be treated, and and uh, that's the bottom line. Kind of golden rule there, but uh, you know that's why we started the practice to you know spend quality time with with patients versus quantity or uh, quality and, qu and quantity amount of time, but not uh, you know not seeing a, a bazillion patients. Um, you know. Average doctor's visits about seven minutes, and of course we spend at least half an hour for follow-up visits and an hour with new patients. But um, as you guys know, looks like uh, I think I got everybody's questions that had questions. I hope this was helpful, and um, you know, sorry I probably kind of rambled on here a little bit, but um, wanted to cram as much as I could in an hour. I may do a follow-up series kind of breaking these down into more digestible chunks to where it's not so long. You know, I, I know my attention span lasts for all of a few seconds here sometimes. And so it's uh, hard to stay tuned for a full hour and, and get as much out of it as you can. But, um, you know, and so there's so many overlaps. The things that we're talking about in this webinar, it's really just functional medicine. And again, getting that root cause, whether we're talking about, you know, cancer or heart disease or Hashimoto's or whatever, um, it's just breaking it down to that, you know, the antecedents, the genetics, the family history, you know, the triggering event wasn't quite the same since and what's the mediators. And so just being that metal, medical detective and, you know, just diving in a little deeper and, um, you know, I obviously have to do that on my own health. And that's kind of what, what started me into integrative medicine, you know, of course, with uh, uh, my dad being a chiropractor and just uh, seeing that it worked and, you know, seeing it work in my personal life and my family's life. So. Well, I appreciate you guys. It's now 11.03, and I will stay on for a minute or two more here. 
um, in case you all have any other questions. Thank you all so much for uh, tuning in on this cold morning. Um, and so if uh, maybe you hopefully had a warm cup of green tea or something healing there. Rachel, you're welcome. Uh, hopefully it was helpful and um, we will hopefully stay tuned for uh, next month and the following months. Um, Cody and Kate and our Alexis just joined the practice, so they should be helping out with some of these as well. And um, we, you know, it's all about education, you know, not medication. And so, you know, just trying to empower you guys to make the best decisions for your health and for for your life, and just being, you know, it's quality of life and just being as productive as possible and and um, just trying to achieve your health goals for 2023. So trying to get started on the right foot. Thanks, Carolyn. Blessings to you, too. All righty, guys. Let's see if I can figure out how to save this. Is the, uh, what button do I have? Can you show the slides on integrative medicine facts for Amarillo slash local? Uh, Samantha, I'm not sure if you're referring to, is that a Facebook group or is there a, you're welcome to share, uh, you know, the webinar and for other people that may benefit from it. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, which facts you're talking about there. But if y'all have any follow-up questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach up, out to us. Um, of course, you can email us or you know Facebook us or uh, call us or you know through the patient portal. We're happy to help you any way we can. And um, uh, stay tuned for our next one. Thank y'all so much. Y'all have a great Saturday. Take care. Bye.